All right, I'm going to do my talk uh, in English because I've had quite a few requests for that. Uh, and I hope you all understand English just fine. It shouldn't be too much of a problem. Um, recently, I announced a new Linux distribution. It's still at a very experimental stage, but I'm going to talk about uh, some of the more innovative things we are doing in that distribution. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to talk about our new init system. So that's going to be the focus of my talk. Um, so this is what I uh, intend to go through. Uh, first, just a short introduction about myself, as these kind of talks is all about self-promotion, of course. Um, and then a lot about uh, Genesis, our new uh, init system. Uh, and finally, some future thoughts and ideas that might make it into uh, Genesis at some point. Um, so, let's start. So, my name is Brian Oestergaard. Um I've been a fairly active open source developer for the last five years at least. Um, and have 10,000 commits or something like that in Gentoo. Uh, I retired from Gentoo now. I retired a year ago or something like that. Um, after retiring from Gentoo, I uh, founded the Xherbo project. Uh, that's my new Linux distribution. Uh, I had thought about it for, for a while before retiring from Gentoo, but after retiring, I had all this free time and stuff. I thought, what am I going to do with all this time? So I started working on this with a few friends. Uh, some of those friends are also here today. Um, and professionally, I work as a developer, uh, developing financial applications currently, but have also been self-employed and done a lot of IT security work and lots of system administration, network administration for lots of companies and stuff like that. So, Xherbo is a Linux distribution built to my specifications, really. Um, I make all the major decisions in Xherbo, and it's very much my project. Uh, but we also have a few other developers, of course, because writing a distribution from scratch, as, as we're doing with Xherbo, is a bit much for one guy. Uh, so I think currently we are about 15 developers or something. Uh, but I'm actually trying to keep the amount of developers down, uh, especially in the beginning, because we are making a lot of quite fundamental changes uh, compared to other Linux distributions. So I want to focus our work on that instead of having tons of developers uh, developing packages for all kinds of software that's not really needed at this point. And instead just focus on getting our init system together, uh, what we are great, uh, going to do with uh, our packaging formats and all, all kinds of stuff like that. Very, very basic stuff for, for distributions and we're doing all this from scratch pretty much. Uh, and that's what, that's one of the big parts at least that makes Xherbo so exciting for me. That we get to do all this very fundamental work, we get to define our own package format from scratch pretty much. We get to write our own init system that gives us all the features we want, that implements all the ideas we like to see in other init systems and so on. Uh, and we can do this both because we are so few developers and we all agree on, on which features we want and which direction we want uh, the Xherbo project to go in, but also because we don't have any users. Uh, and that's a big point because it really allows us to be innovative and just invent things and say, oh, uh, this idea could be cool, but it's going to break everything. Yeah, go ahead and do it. And we'll see and we'll just check it out if it doesn't work out or whatever. Uh, so many days uh, we actually uh, come up with uh, crazy ideas and just implement them because the only boxes you're going to break when, when you change the packaging format completely uh, one day is the other 10 developers boxes and 
they can just fight for themselves, who cares? Uh, so if I had 100,000 users, we couldn't do that at all. Um, so that's one of the great things about keeping it uh, on such a small scale uh, in regards to users. Uh, it's still a very big project, but, but we don't have an impact on users yet, and uh, I hope that can stay a while until we finish the init system and a few other major things. Uh, and as I said, we are doing our own init system, we're doing our own packaging format, uh, and we are uh, doing a lot of stuff uh, with uh, multi-lib and multi-architecture, cross-compiling and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, so all this stuff is pretty much written from scratch. Uh, we're not writing all the packages from scratch in that we're not writing a new web browser or something, but our own way to package uh, Mozilla and Firefox and so on are written from scratch, but also these big systems like the system. Um, so, but as I said, I'm going to focus on the init system in this talk. Um, but first, just uh, shortly, what are in init systems good for anyway? Um, many people believe that init systems are actually needed to bring up the system. That's not true. You, you can have a system just fine without an init system. Uh, and many of you have actually tried that uh, at one time or another, I guess. Because if if you want to, you can just boot up directly in Bash or some other shell, uh, and you often do that if the system is completely screwed up in some way, uh, you can't log in or whatever, uh, you have file system errors or something like that that you need to correct uh, and it doesn't boot properly or whatever, then you just boot up directly in the shell, it could be Bash, it could be BusyBox shell or whatever. Uh, and that actually bypasses the init system. So the init system is supposed to bring up all the normal services. Uh, and normally, you definitely want an init system to bring up your web server, to bring up Xorg, and whatever else you want on your box. Um, so the traditional view of init systems, uh, the System 5 view, is pretty much that the init system is just here to bring up some services and take them down again when, when you shut down the system and not really anymore. Uh, so, so you just specify a bunch of services that you want to start uh, and then you specify uh, uh, which services are going to start before other services and stuff like that, but, but not really any more than that. Um, so it's it's a very rigid system. Uh, it's made somewhat better by by the concept known as run levels, uh, because you can actually specify a run level that's sort of a group of services that you want started when you boot. So so you can boot up in the run level and say I just want to boot up in single user mode, or I just want to boot up in where I just have network, but but no uh, XORG or whatever. Um, so, but a more modern view is uh, employed by uh, Upstart, for example, um, and the idea is to to make an event-based init system. And the idea is that uh, today, at least, uh, networks and machines and all kinds of stuff is much more dynamic than it used to be uh, because I run around with my laptop and I plug it into all kinds of networks and there are wireless networks and I plug various adapters into my laptop and disconnect them all the time and many of these devices and stuff need services running uh, and you might not be able to start these services before the adapter is plugged in and stuff like that. So, so you need uh, some way to catch these events and start services based on that. Uh, and that's what most modern uh, init systems do. So, so they, they add this dynamic features they get from being based on events uh, instead of just looking at the very early startup and 
very late shutdown of systems. Um, my view is that we need a bit more because it's all fine that, that we have these dynamic in, in its systems, but, but we really need something more. We need to be able to monitor services properly. Uh, we need to be aware if a service is just flapping, just going up and down all the time. Uh, if my email server is doing that, I want to know about it. Uh, we need to have uh, better tools to administrate services and control them and so on. Uh, and most of the init systems I looked at isn't very good at that. Um, and one other point is that we really need to get rid of run levels uh, because run levels is a bit of a weird concept. Um, what you really want to, to say to a system is not, I want to boot up in single user mode. You, you want to tell the system, I want to boot up with these free services started, for example. Um, and the, the single user mode uh, run level is a good example of what's really wrong because if you want to boot up your system without all the network services to do some uh, file system maintenance, whatever, you don't want to boot up in a mode where root can only log in one time. Uh, you want to boot up with uh, most of your services disabled, but maybe still a database service running locally if you need that for some of your work. Uh, and you don't don't want to restrict yourself to one login when you can just boot up without network services running, so users can't log in anyway. Uh, so you want more of a group of services started, really. Um, so that would be a better concept. So why is management needed? Well, most init systems right now, you can just say uh, start this service and shut down this service and not really much more. A, a few of them, or most of them probably nowadays, uh, have some idea if the service is running currently. Uh, but that's pretty much all. Um, I want to be much better at, at controlling services. I, I want to be able to say that if a service uh, is known to sometimes leak memory uh, and be a big problem for bugs, uh, then I want to be able to restart the service automatically uh, when it's using too much memory or too much uh, processor usage or whatever. Uh, I want to be able to, to manage things uh, that way so I don't have to sit with my thousand servers and watch all the services all the time and running thousand tops. Uh, to see if anything is wrong and anything needs to be restarted. Um, and the other thing, uh, who should manage services? Um, these days it's quite common to, to have uh, one administrator uh, do all the DNS work and another doing all the database work and so on. Uh, so, so we also need a way to to define who who can control uh, which services and so on. Um, that's fairly important these days uh, because the networks are getting so complex. Um, and if you if you don't know enough about uh, the databases running in a big company, you can really create problems just restarting a service because this whatever stuff you don't really understand and you think. Oh, this service is using a lot of memory, I'm just going to restart it. Uh, and that could cascade uh, to a lot of other services and create a lot of problems. Um, so, so we need some way to, to say that these people can manage these services. Um, and about how, uh, the way I see it, I, I want my unit system genesis uh, to be event based uh, so, so we can control all these dynamic events uh, happening in systems. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going away from the old concept really where 
where you, you type slash ctc slash init uh, slash some service start to start a service. And just uh, just instead I want to emit uh, events to uh, various services. So, so it's all going to be about events uh, and users can emit events also uh, to start and stop services. Uh, but from the service point of view, it's all just uh, events, uh, no matter if it's coming from the system or from the user. So. And then we also need to be able to handle various kinds of errors. Um, and error conditions can be all kinds of stuff, really. Um, it could be a piece of hardware uh, malfunctioning could be uh, a hard disk malfunctioning or a network card uh, malfunctioning or whatever uh, and we need some way of catching these errors um, and, and handling them um, and in many cases we actually get events uh, when, when bad things happen uh, even at the hardware level uh, so we, we do get events about, uh, or, or can at least get events about uh, all the packages going out over some specific network interface uh, suddenly uh, making checksum errors on all packages or whatever. Uh, and we should be able to catch these errors and we should be able to tell services that, okay, this is malfunctioning, what do you want to do? Um, we can't handle errors automatically because depending on the kind of error we need to uh, handle it in different ways but but I'd like to make it possible for the system administrator to say oh if we encounter this error I want to handle it this way and uh, that could be sending an email or whatever is needed uh, shutting down the service or trying to restart it and See if it fails three times in five minutes. I want an email about it or whatever uh, could be needed. Um, and we have the same problem with software errors, really. Uh, sometimes services just uh, get out of control, consumes all the memory, or uh, starts sick folding, or whatever. Um, and oftentimes, we don't really realize that before uh, we try sending an email and your client can't contact the email server or something and then you know oh something is wrong and you can do, take a look at log files and so on and say oh it's sick folded but we should be able to handle that automatically uh, according to the wishes of the system administrator at least in many cases um, and in the same way we can also try catching some of the uh, errors created by s system administrators uh, because as a system administrator I might try to optimize uh, the memory uses of Apache and just add a few too many digits and then it's trying to use 16 gigabytes of memory or something like that uh, creating havoc for uh, all the other services running on the box. Uh, so, so adding some limits to how how much memory, how much of uh, various resources a service is supposed to use, can also help catch some of these errors at an early stage. Uh, what should be monitored? Um, we should be able to monitor all services uh, quite easily. Just get an overview picture of. How, how are uh, the health of all our services running on some box or another? Um, but we should also be able to specify exactly which services uh, is interesting to me uh, and what properties of these services are interesting to me. Uh, one service might be interesting to see uh, how many processes has it fought and another might be interesting to look at the memory usage and a third one might be interesting to look at the uh, processor usage and so on. Uh, so we should be able to monitor all these things and we should be able to 
specify in some way uh, what it is we want to monitor. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I'm going to talk a bit more later about how it should be monitored. Uh, but, but my basic idea is that we sh we should define some some well-known interfaces uh, and APIs for scripts to uh, to interface uh, to to the init system. So so instead of passing uh, random output uh, intended for users, we should have APIs uh, that scripts can interface with uh, to to provide better monitoring. Um, so. Large networks. Um, large networks have the same problems as single uh, boxes has, of course. Um, but it's much harder usually to monitor a thousand servers than just monitoring your laptop, of course. Uh, because what are you going to do if if you have a thousand servers and you want to monitor all the services? Um, you really need some efficient way to do that. You, you can't log into all these servers and just have a thousand X terms open uh, and try to monitor uh, various uh, resource usage on all these boxes. Um, so what people usually do is that the, they use Nagios or similar tools uh, or, or create their own scripts to uh, to monitor uh, usage and monitor service status on all these different boxes, and then they push these scripts out to all these boxes, and then the scripts are supposed to email you or whatever when something goes wrong. Um, and I think that the init system can really provide a much better way of doing this, because the init system should know uh, the status of all these services. Uh, so why not make it available to to administrators, uh, so I really want easy access to status of services, uh, and I want detailed knowledge about system help because the init system again should should have a fairly good idea of this. Uh, so, so just making it available really, um, and on on large networks. Uh, the, the obvious thing to do here would really be to provide all this information uh, through uh, SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol, that, that's already used to monitor uh, all kinds of devices like printers and servers and stuff. But you can you can use SNMP to, to monitor uh, temperatures of processors and hard disk and uh, uh, how much space is is free on your uh, petitions and stuff like that, uh, and it would be fairly obvious to use it uh, for the init system as well uh, as a well-known interface uh, for these kind of data. Um, and there, yeah, I want programmable access to monitoring status and controlling services, and again, that's because. What you want to monitor really depends on on which services you have deployed and what are your uh, demands of these services, uh, which services are important, which services can you do without and for an hour or two, and uh, some services might you might do uh, without just fine and just get them back up tomorrow or, or something, uh, while other services are, are much more critical, of course. Uh, so. So I want to provide access to to really make your own monitoring uh, application fairly easily. Uh, so some future ideas. Um, these are ideas that uh, I haven't quite decided if I want in Genesis or not. Um, Genesis being uh, event-based. Uh, also means that I could add uh, time-based events, uh, and if I do that, I have cron for free, so to speak, because the system is already uh, able to run scripts. Uh, so if I can just define a time-based event and say uh, at two o'clock p.m. Uh, every day or something, run this script, that's cron really. Um, I haven't decided quite yet if I want. Uh, 
if I really want to do that with Genesis or not, uh, because the existing cron systems are fairly good, actually. Um, so I'm probably going to end up just uh, off offering it as an option and people can do whatever they want. It solves a few problems. Um, in some cases, uh, people use cron to, to start some script that's supposed to run for 20 minutes, and then an hour later they run another script uh, that can only run after the first is finished, and they just run it an hour later because it's only supposed to take 20 minutes, so you're almost guaranteed that it's finished by that time. Uh, if we use Genesis uh, for cron-like events, we can actually just add dependencies between these services. So as soon as the first service is finished running, we can start the next. Or if it fails, we can just not start the next, uh, which is slightly better than what cron is able to do. Uh, you can add some checking uh, like this to your cron scripts, of course. Uh, but in some ways, it might be slightly better. I don't know. Um, integration with package manager. Um, if you upgrade uh, OpenSSL, for example, uh, a lot of services might want to be restarted. Uh, the init system can't know that, uh, but the package manager can. Uh, you can add a metadata to the packages saying, oh, when I update the OpenSSL library, I want to restart Apache and OpenSSH and so on. Uh, but integrating the unit system with the package manager in such a way is a bit hacky and I'm not too, too crazy about it, but, but we might be able to, to find a, a reasonable way for the package managers to say these services want to be restarted at some point uh, and then have a, another tool saying uh, that, that you can use to, to view that list and restart services. With. Uh, so, so we don't have that direct integration because I, I still want to be able to change my init system, I want to be able to change my package manager and so on. Uh, and it shouldn't be one big package, uh, it should be separate packages that I can switch around if I want to. Uh, and hooking into the init system, I'm sure if I provide an API to hook into the init system at various points, I'm sure uh, some people could come up with some really cool solutions uh, for, for handling various aspects of feeding scripts. Um, and I need, I need these interfaces f for my own purposes anyway, uh, so I might as well expose them in a nice uh, library uh, for other people to use and provide C++ bindings or whatever, and a bash interface or whatever. Uh, we might come up with uh, I give people a bit of chance of integrating their own custom solutions with the unit system and in summary um, I mentioned a few times not here today but, but in other places on my blog and so on that innovation doesn't happen that much in open source, unfortunately. Um, it's very incremental, the development uh, we see. We get a new version of Firefox that adds a few features and so on, but uh, we don't really have uh, that much innovation uh, as such. But, but in a few areas, innovation really happens fairly rapidly. Uh, we've been able to work on example for about a year now. Uh, and create our own from scratch pretty much packaging format. Uh, originally it was based on Gentoo's package format, Ebels, uh, but it's changed in millions of ways since then and it's still changing uh, fairly rapidly. Uh, we haven't implemented Genesis yet, but we've come up with all these ideas. Uh, we've been able to make some test code for some of this. Uh, we've been able to come up with lots of ideas on how we want to handle cross-compiling and all sorts of stuff. So in some areas at least innovation happens fairly rapidly uh, and, and that's quite exciting to me at least. Uh, and another thing is that 
even old system that everybody knows, like the unit system that nobody has really touched the last 25 years, more or less. Okay, upstart and other event-based system came around, but but there hasn't been much development in 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 systems. Uh, we can still improve on, on all these old uh, systems, uh, or many of them at least. Uh, Partly because the world has changed, of course, uh, but also because we have better ideas about what we want to use these systems for. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities to take all these old systems that we've been used to uh, for the last 25 years or something and don't really think about uh, in the day-to-day -day life and, and take a fresh look at them and see Oh, is this really what how we want to work uh, with these things, or can we improve on this in some way or another? Uh, and finally, I want to, uh, as I've shown with an example, uh, I want to be part of driving some of these uh, new ideas and some of this innovation. Uh, and some of these ideas that we have, for example, might not really amount to anything at all, and some of them might end up being fairly popular. I don't know, uh, but that's part of the excitement. And I've I've told other distribution developers, lots of other distribution developers and gents developers in particular, to to take a look at example and take a look at all the ideas we have some of the code we have and just tell them to steal all the ideas that you think are worth stealing really. Uh, because if some of my ideas uh, if can be used in other distributions and, other, and lots of users can benefit from them, well that's just great. Uh, that would be wonderful. Um, so I hope other distributions will steal at least some of our ideas. Uh, some of the same ideas. Hopefully. So, yes, that's it. So. so, are there any questions?